This is Akashwani. In the program Spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on United Nations Landmark Treaty on Protection of Marine Life. The participants are Mukul Sanwal, environmentalist, and Rajesh Lake, anchor. The treaty to protect biodiversity in waters outside national boundaries known as the high seas covering nearly half of Earth's surface had been under discussion for more than 20 years as efforts to reach an agreement had repeatedly stalled. But it changed yesterday. Delegates from the 193 member nations approved the treaty with jubilation. There wasn't a single objection. Mr. Sanmal, this is indeed a very happy moment because without any objection, the treaty has been approved. That's right. You see, it's a, not a, a simple issue because we have looked at conservation and pollution control on the land surface. We have looked at the carbon dioxide accumulating in the atmosphere leading to climate change. And now we are looking at the marine life and the oceans which cover a much larger area and have a very important part in our lives because they have ecological, economic, social and food security benefits. And that affects all countries, rich and poor. The fact that there was no objection is a reflection of one single point in the treaty that the benefits would be shared fairly and equitably. Because most countries, or almost all countries, do not have the scientific capacity or the research institutions to study the deep oceans. India has. The developed countries have. So the other countries were apprehensive that minerals may be located, biotechnology benefits will arise, and since it is considered the common heritage of mankind, they should also be part of the beneficiaries. And I think that recognition led to the sealing of the agreement after 20 years. It's a very important signal for multilateralism also. Richer or developed countries are prepared to share benefits that they derive from the common heritage of mankind. Okay. And um, as you very rightly pointed out, United Nations has adopted the first ever treaty to protect the marine life in the high seas. And also the UN Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres uh, hailed the historic agreement as giving the ocean a fighting chance. Now what was happening that we have to use words like fighting chance, uh, Mr. Sanwal? You see, the, uh, the analogy with the land surface is very appropriate here. Just as we have protected tigers by declaring centuries, by having an arrangement to keep track of their numbers, to develop science as to the, what kind of ecosystem they need to thrive. Exactly this is happening with the marine environment. Areas are going to be designated as protected, where there is wide ecosystems or marine life which are endangered. And then the external influences which influence these protected areas are going to be regulated. Take the case of the centuries on the land surface. If you build a road, there has to be an environment impact assessment and some kind of regulation is there. Human ingress is regulated and the villagers who were there have been translocated to the boundary areas. So that it is not just the tiger, but the ecosystem that the tiger needs to thrive is secured. Similarly, it has been found that overfishing, shipping lanes and even pollution leads to damage or affects the health of the ecosystem of the protected areas. So they are going to be regulated. And as time goes on, as more scientific evidence is available, and just as in the case of conservation of wildlife or ecosystems on the land surface, these ideas will develop, more cooperation will take place, and this treaty will evolve. But the direction has been set in a very clear manner in a very cooperative manner. The new treaty is under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which came into force in 1994, before marine biodiversity was a well-established uh, concept. What happened in this period, and why was the need, what has necessitated this treaty to come into force? See, the Law of the Seas 
convention was responded to a very different context it was more about freedom of navigation of the seas there was some reference to minerals that what would happen if some minerals were detected or found on the ocean floors they would be shared equitably but there was absolutely no reverence reference to the biodiversity to the ecosystems to the living organisms in the deep ocean partly because we didn't have the scientific knowledge and partly because we were not aware of the potential benefits it would provide for human kind as this knowledge developed largely out of the research on climate change and on the land surface we realized the close linkage between the oceans the atmospheres and the land surface the, the organisms in the oceans also emit oxygen they, and the oceans absorb carbon dioxide and as i had said earlier they have ecological economic social and food security benefits as as we went along we realized that this was going to be an important aspect and also an aspect that had been left out as i said the atmosphere was regulated the land surface was regulated and this and the oceans were not regulated as developed countries came to realize that they need to share developing countries were no longer very poor and were looking at these matters with a different eye there could be a meeting of minds and as i said earlier this treaty only sets a direction but the framework that has been designed is cooperative and it is likely to evolve and it is only with the rules that are framed more science is developed that we will realize the full potential of what has happened now so the new treaty will be opened for signatures on september 20 during the annual meeting of world leaders at the general assembly and uh, it will uh, take effect once it is ratified by 60 countries so mr sonbal will you please talk about uh, the creation of a new body to manage conservation of ocean life and establish marine protected areas in the high seas the as soon as the ratification takes place a secretariat would be set up that means an administrative setup would emerge and there will be bodies on science implementation because that is the normal practice and as new science develops more implementation aspects will be taken up because implementation will not be at the international level implementation will have to be at the national level and similarly science is developed at both the national and international levels through cooperative arrangements but implementation is purely national and that is where the interplay will take place some of some bit of politics but mostly because of the way the treaty has been designed it will be cooperative and forward looking but it will all take time it will take time primarily because the research that is needed to back up the new treaty is limited to very few countries out of 192 countries i envisage something like 20 countries alone have the capacity to or are actually studying o deep oceans so more than 160 70 countries have no science in backup have no institution dealing with this have no department in the government dealing with oceans their capacity will have to be built up their understanding will have to be built up india fortunately is in a very good position because we have a department for oceans affairs we have an institute on oceanography in goa that institute already has something like 60 patents before it because one big incentive for the treaty has been the biotechnology and the medicines and other resources that emerge out of the genetic material in 1922 the biotechnology from marine resources was worth 6 billion and it is likely to double very soon more countries will take advantage some of this will be shared by the others so something new has happened in the world not only in terms of bringing people together for to regulate nature to conserve nature but also to share the benefits and i think that is part breaking this treaty mr sanwal i believe will also establish uh, ground rules for conducting environmental impact assessments for commercial activities in the oceans my question is who will monitor these commercial interests of the nations you see ultimately the rules will be framed which will regulate rather than monitor that is what i envisage from the experience of similar treaties for example shipping lanes are going to be regulated now it is easy to monitor shipping lanes because we are already doing that every ship every aircraft is monitored not because of conservation but because of safety security and other reasons so once the shipping lane is regulated it will be easy to see that ship, uh, shipping traffic is not going to areas 
where it should not be going. So I think what with uh, similarly with overfishing, you know, the trawlers are monitored. Over exploitation. Uh, exploitation. Ocean so acidification. Today's, today's technology, today's uh, understanding of the problem of implementation. Problem is not insurmountable. The difficulty is in agreeing to what should be regulated and in what manner. And that is going to take time. Because each country will see it from its own perspective. We have agreed that marine biodiversity is a common heritage of mankind. But when it comes to regulation of specific activities, countries will see it from how it will impact them. So in some senses, the politics is going to play out in the future. And it is going to take a while. It will take a decade at least for things to fall in place. So over one third of fish stocks are being harvested uh, at unsustainable levels. And this is being said by the UN chief. And uh, he also said that we are polluting our coastal waters with chemicals, plastics and and human waste. Now, whose uh, responsibility is this? See, ultimately, it comes down to the nations. Correct. Take the case of overfishing. The trawlers belong to a country. The produce goes to a particular country. But the question of overfishing has a slight nuance in it because it is certain areas, particularly in the North Atlantic, that have been overfished. Areas in the tropics, say around the Lakshadweep, have not been overfished. If people come from outside to fish, but 200 nautical miles into the ocean is the economic zone of a country. So we regulate that. India is looking at that. The question of pollution and plastics is more serious because the traditional method of disposal of waste in coastal towns has been to put a pipe somewhat deep into the ocean and let the waste flow into the ocean, reflecting the thinking at that time that the waste will get diluted in the ocean. At that time, we were looking only in terms of sight, smell, and what we could see on the... Now, when we start looking at the impact on biodiversity, that is going to change. Plastics is another example. Something like 300 million tons of plastic are produced every day, which are not recycled. 10 million goes into the oceans worldwide. As countries develop further, more plastic is going to be used. It is a national problem because it blocks the drains. And it becomes a biodiversity problem because plastic that ultimately flows into the ocean disintegrates into microchips. It settles at the bottom, is eaten by the fish that feed or that live at the bottom of the ocean, gets absorbed by them, has an adverse effect on them. Once that fish is eaten by a human being, it passes on to the human being. Yes, it will impact the human life as well. Yes, but the, but the key point is that we really do not know what is happening at the bottom of the ocean. And that is, I think, the breakthrough that that has taken place with a treaty like this, that now scientific priorities will shift to the bottom of the ocean, not just to discover minerals which are of economic value or biotechnology which is of direct economic value, but also conservation of marine biodiversity. What are the possible challenges that the authorities would encounter in the enforcement of this treaty and how will they overcome it? You see, the most important challenge will be getting consensus on how regulation to take place. Because the manner in which we regulate an activity will determine how much flexibility the country has and how much is being imposed on a country by the international world. And what is the scientific basis for it so that they can convince their citizens to take on that burden. And that is what has bedeviled the climate treaty also. And that is going to take time. Not only to develop the science, but also to share that science, to develop a common understanding on the human population. So it's just not the common heritage, but there must be a common understanding understanding of the problems and the solutions. Thank you so much, Mr. Mukul Sanwal, for being with Akashwani. Thank you. You were listening to a discussion on United Nations Landmark Treaty on Protection of Marine Life. The participants were Mukul Sanwal, environmentalist, and Rajesh Lake, anchor. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of Akashwani. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel, News on AIR official. You may share your feedback about this program through email at airnsdtalks at gmail.com or WhatsApp on 92890940.